Okie doke. Just getting started. 6 3 2019, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Someone asked me last time if I would sing, um, if I knew any Italian songs, and I actually started to look some up. And, um, and I started to learn them. I remember hearing them when I was a child, some that we've all known. Hi, Kathy. Nice to see you. Um, and then um, I had such a busy week that I didn't. Um, hi, Eileen. Eileen's always early. Hi, Eileen. Lynn, hello. Lovely to see you too, Lynn. Hi, Joanne. Kathy, good evening. <laughs> From Illinois, Eileen, yes. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. And so the only thing that I think of was um, playing the mandolin. <laughs> Return to Sorrento. I used to play it on the piano when I was a little girl. <laughs> only I played on the mandolin now, the voice mandolin. <laughs> So um, <laughs> let's get serious. Um, I, you know, a lot of times I talk about what I've been doing during the week. And um, it's been a very busy week. We've launched a course. This is our last class coming up this week um, on the course titled Toxins. Uh, I'm toxic. You're toxic. We're all toxic. <laughs> and it was rethinking toxins. So it's been a very busy month or so. Um, so I've not, um, put, um, more time into my life in general. My, one of our sons is here with us, which is great as always. And another son just left. So they come and visit us from time to time, which makes our lives richer. There's no doubt about it. But one of the things that I like to do in my spare time is I love swimming, love it. And so I've talked about before um, how I um, um, have been swimming lately and how my, I've had this problem with my eye and itching. And I think I might be onto something. I believe it is the swimming pool. Now, I've not been in a swimming pool for years. This is an outdoor pool right in our little, we have a six unit complex that we live in right on the beach, which is great. I could go swimming in the water, but the water is really awful right now, the ocean water, because there's this algae that's come up. It looks like seaweed. I don't know if it's algae or seaweed, to be honest, uh, but it's pretty uncomfortable to swim in because it's all brown and it just clings to you everywhere. So I've not been swimming in the ocean. Instead, I've been swimming in this pool, and I've been swimming for minimum 45 minutes a day. I absolutely love it. And I suspect that that's what's happening here is, is that I've got an allergy to whatever they're putting in the pool. It is chlorine, but there could be other um, inerts or other uh, products that are being added to the chlorine. And I am so stubborn. I am not going to give it up. I love swimming. It feels so good. It feels like I'm doing something good for myself. It's so much pleasure. And I do the backstroke and I look up and I see the palm trees all around us. And it's just so glorious that um, I've not been willing to give it up. So my eye is still swollen. It's pretty itchy. I was just telling my husband, it's so wrinkled under my eyes because it's so swollen and all that um, I look like I've aged about 10 years. And it's humbling. It's humbling. I should be able to fix this. But I have not put as much effort into it as I should. I know I should be doing more. Um, so um, as I've taught in my toxin course and other times as well, we can use the subject that is the etiology, the cause of the etiology. If I knew 100% that it was the chlorine, and I'm probably going to do this, I can actually get chlorine or actually get the water from my pool because I don't know whether or not it's chlorine or what it is for that matter, and make a remedy from that. So as you know, if you know anything about homeopathy, and for those of you who don't, let me tell you, we homeopaths love toxins because it's the most toxic stuff that is, makes the most beautiful medicines because, of course, it's diluted. We dilute it 30 times to the 100th power if it's 30C. We dilute it um, 200 times to the 100th power if it's 200C, and it makes the best medicines. So I'm actually 
probably going to get that that uh, pool water and um, and make it into homeopathic medicine and take it then and then that would not actually be homeopathy. Um, we would uh, we might call it isopathy. That is the the general name for it. Um, there are other ways of describing this, but that's basically what it is. Hi, heart to you, heart to you, all of you. It's great to see everyone. Oregon, that's Dana, and Michigan is Carol, and Minnesota is Sandy, and hi, oh, Maria from Australia. It's fun when you see people that you know. Maria is from Australia, and she and her husband came to uh, Buffalo, New York one time, and we made a point of meeting each other. We went out to dinner. So um, it's fun to be able to see people that you've been working with on Zoom for all these years, and then you get a chance to meet them. It's a beautiful thing. Jill from South Carolina, Cindy from Burton, Ohio. So another one of my pleasures in life is I uh, love watching certain YouTube uh, personalities, and I've said this before, I love, and I mean I love Dennis Prager, P-R-A-G-E, I've said it before, and one of the things that I was reading of his the other day or watching, now I've gotten so much, you know, I don't know whether or not I'm reading it or I'm watching it. I've just ordered his book. I've got a couple of his other of his pieces. And he talks about the importance of having a hobby and uh, how that's kind of gone to the wayside for a lot of people. And it's probably because hobbies were, came from <clears throat> almost a necessity of sorts. So women needed sweaters so they or their families needed sweaters so they learned to knit men needed to make a shed for the goats so they learned carpentry and then from there it takes off and it becomes more interesting or cooking is a great hobby it was very much a hobby of mine it's not so much lately because um although i love to cook it's not as much fun cooking just for my husband and the dog and me so when my sons are around i get more into it um but hobbies, they, are, they add value to life. They add perspective. They add a skill set. They add um, a different way of looking at life so that you can approach it from a different point of view so that you're not stuck in one way and we're not expecting someone else to give it to us all the time. When my husband and I were struggling financially um, for years, we struggled financially. And um, I, rec I, I love interior design. It's another hobby of mine. And um, I loved making our home beautiful, but I didn't have the money to go to antique stores. So I would go to the, you know, garage sales and Salvation Army and Goodwill and those kinds of places and make something from nothing. And I'm sure many of you are like that because it takes a certain kind of person to be willing to step outside of the box. And so um, there was a time when I didn't even want to buy bed sheets. <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous, but they were expensive. And we had so many expenses at one point that I would get, I would get sheets that were decent um, and cut them down and make them to fit the beds. And even though they might've been only a twin sheet that I would purchase that might've been used or a second or something, I would uh, stitch them together and do French seams all along them, make them really nice and make them into king size sheets by, by a king size set so that we had a good size. And I don't know. It felt good to me to do that. I love doing those kinds of things. So hobbies are very valuable. And so homeopathy started out kind of as a hobby for me mostly. However, probably more importantly, was it was out of necessity too. Um, we had this, um, even, even I was thinking today, my son remembered, you know, mom, even our dog had a hobby. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, we had a dog whose name was Dolly. It was Buster, the dog we have now, his mother. And um, she had a hobby. She, we lived on a 15-acre farm of sorts. And we had apple trees all in the back, a stand of them. And she would sit on the back lawn and face the apple trees in the late summer and watch the apple fall. You know, you can imagine that's a whole day to watch an apple fall. It's like watching grass grow. She would sit and watch. And at, when the apple would fall, it would go She'd hear flutter, flutter up at the top. Maybe a bird <laughs> inspired it, and it would go mm, thump. And as soon as you heard that thump, Dolly would get up. You'd hear her collar dangling. She'd go pick up the apple, put it but in front of her, and she had collected something like 30 apples every day. They had just a little dog. 
teeth and marks in them and she would put them aside and collect every apple from the apple trees that fell. It was just the cutest thing. So her, uh, her hobby was um, apple collecting. So if homeopathy is your hobby, <laughs> or even if apple collecting is, make it a great hobby. I guess that's what I'm saying. Uh, because these hobbies can turn into uh, bigger than life. And so that's what I wanted to share with you and get that get that get you inspired to do that. So tonight we're going to we're going back to the Materia Medica, my Materia Medica. You can use any Materia Medica. In fact, I urge you to do so. Um, go online, you, uh, take a look at James Tyler Kent's Materia Medica. That is free, um, and you could just read any any remedy you would like. Tonight we're going into the B's. We finished with the A's. Um, and you know, I might go back every once in a while if I see something that's got a, a kind of a unifying thread, we need to bring it back to make my point. So today we're going to bees and the name of the medicine today is Baptisia tinctoria. Great word. Love these words, Baptisia tinctoria. And what this medicine is, it's, oh, it's, it's wild indigo. And so I wore, I don't know if it looks like blue tonight, but it is blue. It's an indigo blue and I wore it purposely, um, to help you remember that it is wild indigo, and it is used for a combination of acute conditions. The, the, the keynote is fever with, I'm looking back, making sure that I've got it right, confusion, um, stupor, kind of a drunken stupor sense when somebody is sick with a fever, and aching muscles and sore throat. Now there are other symptoms that accompany this, but that those are the keynotes. So the person can have a flushed face, there's a heaviness, there can be nightmares. So if anytime we see a delusion or fevers that are high or that kind of thing, then we can look at all kinds of central nervous system disturbances such as hallucinations or nightmares or talking in the sleep and those kinds of things. So that can be, um, uh, something that you might want to, you can even pull from outside of what I'm saying and say, you know, I wonder if this would fit. Well, it most likely does if it has to do with the way the brain is, is thinking. So it's difficult for the person to swallow. The sore throat is pretty, is pretty prominent. And this is a great medicine for right now. I'm getting lots of, uh, uh, calls and, uh, uh, folks telling me that their whole family has been sick with a sore throat a fever, um, and a, a achiness, heaviness, and, um, and they've never said anything about hallucinations. You don't have to have hallucinations, but I'm just telling you that if it goes that far, that really makes it clear. So all of these medicines have a, um, what would I say, a char characteristics that sound very extreme, but you don't need to have that extremeness per se in order to use the medicine. So there's a, there's a depth and breadth to these medicines. You can use Baptisia just because someone has a fever and a sore throat. That could be good enough. Um, but if you also have that, the, uh, the stupor and the heaviness, that makes it even clearer. So let's see what else we've got here. I want to make sure. The person complains they have achy muscles as well, which of course makes sense when you get a fever and sore throat, etc. People often feel achy and the bed feels too hard. They keep complaining, something's wrong with this bed. It feels too hard and they keep shifting into different positions. There's another medicine. I'm going to ask if anyone happens to know this one um, that has uh, the sense that the bed is too hard. So um, let me know what you think. Let me know if somebody comes through on this, Perry, okay? I want to know that um, 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 if we've got some others who happen to remember what other remedy covers that. So there is a feeling of, if there's a gastrointestinal um, um, aspect of this, and there often is, as you can imagine, with a fever and aching and all of that business, um, then the, um, the, the person may feel as though they can't tolerate liquids. And, and solids, solid foods would actually make them gag. Now, you would think that it has more to do with the throat with that condition, but it has more to do with the gut. Regardless, however, if they can't swallow or they feel as though they, if they eat solids, that they feel as though they could gag, um, then we know even more so. We would normally be thinking, gee, I wonder what, they, what they've eaten and if it's a stomach flu. We don't really need to know that. 
I had a family I spoke to today who uh, children had strep throat. And we know that strep throat, and we're going to be talking about that, remedies that are specific for strep throat. But if you didn't know that it was strep because you um, have never had it before or you've not been to the pediatrician to have it tested, then um, a strep throat just can mean there's a strong odor to the breath and there can be um, um, pustules and redness and uh, a creaminess on the throat. But there's a, there's a distinct strep odor to a strep throat. I'm not going to tell you that Baptisia is specific for strep, but I will tell you that there is an odor in relationship to this medicine. So the person, especially if you haven't caught it really quickly, they can, their breath can be bad. There's a, the stool can be very strong. Um, the, um, just, just emanating an, a, a sickly odor coming, emanating from this person is an indication that you might want to use Baptisia tinctoria. Um, let's see. They can't stand pressure. So there they are with a fever and a sore throat and they're gagging. I mean, this is a lot. And they're, um, uh, not able to swallow and they can't stand any pressure on them. So if they've got pajamas on, they might take them off or they might want pajamas that don't fit very well, or they're pushing their clothing away from their body. Um, they can't stand to have too much covering on them, not because of the heat, but because of the pressure. So any kind of uh, pressure from clothing is very much disliked. And let's see what else we've got here. I want to make sure that I've covered enough of this so that it really fleshes it out. Um, here it is. One odd characteristic is the sensation or delusion that the body is breaking up into many pieces. Now you would think that, what, what are you talking about? But remember, there are, can be delusions with these fevers and delusions can be of, um, you know, strange people walking in the room or that something terrible is happening or that mom, when it's a child is a monster. So the feeling that they're breaking apart is you can't imagine having that until you have it. And then once you've had it, you say, okay, now I get what that means. Again, if you're the person that you're working with, your loved one, your child, your husband, um, your friend, has only half of these symptoms, it's reason enough to consider using Baptisia tinctoria. So it is one of our best medicines for um, fevers, and constrictions. Now let's see what we've got here. Perry, you've got a lot of uh, questions here. Let's see if I can find some questions here that I can get into. Um, so what I would do um, is use it in a 30th potency. I know that's what folks are going to be asking me. I would use it in a 30th potency because you can find it in most homeopathy kits, which by the way, if you don't have one, then, um, then I'll go all the way to the top, Perry. Um, and then if, if uh, you don't have a kit, be sure to own one. It really doesn't make sense to learn all of this. And then you've got all the remedy or you don't have any of the remedies and you know exactly what to do. Oh, but you don't own that. And you got to wait till the store opens two days from now. So you want to make sure that you own those. Um, so I might use it in a 30th potency or 200 C or X. More often than not, we are using C's these days in the U.S. When I first started using homeopathy, um, I was we were oh, it was very hard to find C's. We were only using them in X's pretty much. So it would be 30 X or 200 X. But these days, you see how isn't that funny looking? My goodness, you know I I try not to look at myself because I can see this eyes partially closed and all puffy and wrinkly. Um, so um, 30 or 200, and then I might use it every, say, four hours, and you see how it goes. You give it one dose, and if it doesn't act, wait another four hours, give another dose. You know, if it's really severe, then you might wait only two or three hours, but four hours is our benchmark, and you give that four hours, and then you wait. No change. Okay, wait another four hours. Now you're on the second dose. Wait, still no change. Go for another four hours and give the third dose. If you've gone to the fourth dose and you see no improvement, and I'm not talking about complete cure. Don't expect necessarily, compute, uh, we do see that sometimes in acutes, that it happens that quickly. But if you don't see that, don't think, oh, well, it didn't do it all the way. No, no, no. You're looking for satellite conditions to shift as well. You're looking for the person to act as though the delusions are gone now or the, or the gagging is not so severe 
or the other conditions might be they are comfortable enough to have put their clothes back on again and they haven't said anything or about it. They just simply put on the pajamas that are a little bit warmer, a little more comfortable in spite of the fact that they have an elastic waistband. Um, all righty, let's see what else we've got. No, for you, as someone asked a question about, so I would use um, saliva, and that's not what I would use. I would actually use, I think the question was here, so you can just take your own saliva when you're sick and make a remedy out of it. No, that's not what I would say, although there are homeopathic medicines made from um, conditions like that. No, instead, I would use, uh, if you're talking about um, my, swim, my swimming pool problem, I would take some water from the swimming pool and make it into a homeopathic medicine. I won't go into it tonight. We'll talk about that some other night because that I, I, I uh, uh, cover that pretty thoroughly in my survivalist guide, should you ever be interested. It's a very extensive guide on what to do if you need to survive in very extreme situations using counting on homeopathy. Um, Eileen says she's addicted to learning homeopathy. Yeah, I bet, Eileen, because you're always the first one <laughs> to join us. <laughs> you can always tell. Um, for so could, Would Baptista work with sore throat for, from allergies? Not my first thought. It's not my first thought. I'd like to see Baptista more frequently or more used more in conjunction with a fever. It's a great fever remedy. So if there's a fever and a sore throat, then I would go more along those lines. But for a sore throat with from allergies, you might want to think of just something as simple as ferrum fos. F-E-R-R-U-M, ferrum fos, P-H-O-S. And you could just use the cell salt, which is a 6X, right from Highlands. Highlands is, you can purchase on from Amazon. Hello from Northern Virginia. That's Francis. Okay, let's see. What do you say to skeptics, skeptics who think that their children don't receive antibiotics for strep, that they may later get something like rheumatic fever? Um, well, that's just, I believe that's an untruth. Um, you don't get it if you don't take antibiotics. You can still get rheumatic fever if you do take antibiotics. It's a less of a chance, but it's not about later. It's about either you get it or you don't get it. So um, it's uh, strep throat is uh, not a lot to be afraid of if someone has, has had rheumatic fever or rheumatic fever is, is um, in the family and is a prominent condition in the family, then there's more of a chance of someone getting rheumatic fe fever. But rheumatic fever is not that common. And you might want to look that up, look up those statistics. How often do people even get them? And then look at the statistics of what occurs as a result of using antibiotics. Um, I consider antibiotics uh, pretty powerful stuff. And I don't mean necessarily in a positive way, although it can be positive in certain circumstances. Um, if you don't have the homeopathic medicine, you don't know what to use, then uh, you know it can save lives. But there is a price to pay with antibiotics. There is no doubt about it. Okay, do you find C and X are pretty much interchangeable? You bet. I do believe that they're quite interchangeable. Every once in a while, oh, that's Christy. Hi, nice to see you, Christy. Um, um, I, um, I, I see them as quite interchangeable unless we're using a specific protocol. Now, what I'm describing tonight with this Baptisia um, is not a protocol. That, and what I mean by that is I have not told you exactly what potency to use, nor have I told you exactly the timing. I've given you kind of some leeway. You can use a 30 or 200. And it, so I'm leaving it kind of open. So it's not a specific protocol. But once we get to specific protocols that I teach on my blog, and I tell you, this is a Banerjee protocol, or this is a specific protocol, then I urge you to stay as tight as you possibly can to uh, the method that I'm teaching. Okay, hope your eye is better soon, Joe, and I get so frustrated when a condition takes a while. Thank you for being so real with us. Yeah, you know why? You know what I think this is? It's old allergy stuff. As I, as I said, I got this when I was a kid, and um, it's going to take time. And I'm, as I said, I'm stubborn. I'm a stubborn old coot. I want to swim. And I just say I'm not going to give up my swimming, and so I'm going to have to find something else. 
until now if it got really really bad and I've talked about this before then I would um, you know if my whole face started to swell up and all then I suppose I'd be I'd have to give it up for a while but it's hard to do because the whole point as far as I'm concerned and living in Florida is to be outside in the weather so okay um, okay yeah, someone says, I went ahead and gave the antibiotics for strep, but following up other symptoms with other remedies. Certainly you may do that. Absolutely you may do that. And don't feel guilty. Listen, we all have our timing. You know, when you're first learning homeopathy, you learn, now, and now when you know that your child is going to get strep because he's had strep before, learn those medicines. So this is a great opportunity, Francine. I thought it said, uh, no, it's Francine, not Francis. Francine, when you know that your child now has already had that, now make a point of knowing those medicines. Look on my blog. I talk about strep throat. Um, where else have I taught? Well, I've taught about it in my course, um, Alternative to Antibiotics. You can learn an awful lot about that with um, um, with how to how to approach it and ha and then own those medicines so that you are not left in the dark next time and then you can go ahead and use it next time so let's see uh would swim goggles protect it good point no i don't think it's about my eyes i actually think it's about just marinating in the water <laughs> i really do uh, because i've also got some little patches of eczema here and there too i haven't had that for ah, 60 years so it's this it's not just my eye it's other little areas of my body so no i don't think it's just my eyes and um but i thought about it <laughs> i certainly thought of it and then i realized no that doesn't make sense i don't even put my eyes in the water many times i stay above water and don't let the water going uh, go on them so um all right do we have any other questions let's see i want to make sure let's see x's and c's after fourth dose with no change look for the satellite conditions to to have improved now let's say that that medicine after four doses for Four, and the way I like to say it's the fours. Four pills, that's a dose. Every four hours, that's the general rule of thumb. Up to four potent four doses. At the end of the fourth dose, if you see no change, no change at all, then watch for this. Watch for something new. Watch for something that might have not shown up before. Now maybe the person has constipation. Or now the person, um, the fever might be gone, but something else has come up. There's a rash, there are hives. So now you've got some information to use that specific um, set of conditions to, to come up with the next medicine that you need to go to. So the wrong medicine can give you the correct guideline as to where to go. Okay, let's see if we've got any other questions. Did you say go to the top, Perry? Work for sore throat allergies, I've got that. Hi from Jupiter Farms, yeah, hi. Oh, it's so great. In Florida, addicted to homeopathy. I think we've got a wrap here. The last one. There's one more question at the very bottom. What should, uh, what about for fluid in child's ear and started with a sore throat? If the sore throat still is presenting and it looks like a baptisia, there's the fever and everything, then you might still be able to use it. But if once it migrates to the ear, it is generally a different medicine. And if you look up on my blog, I guarantee I've probably got at least two, I've probably got plenty more than that, of medicines that are specific for ear infections, otitis media, and even if it's just fluid in the ear. Now, if there's fluid in the ear, let me backtrack a little bit, because someone has looked in the ear with an otoscope and has declared such, such as the pediatrician, but the child is not sick, and the child has no hearing loss, and there's no squishy sensation in the ear, and there's nothing going on that the child's complaining of, I don't know that I would work with that. I don't know that I would treat it. What's there to treat? I, my, I, the body often has the ability to correct itself on its own. We don't need to treat everything. We treat pathologies. And so if it's a pathology or you know that that ear, that with, with the liquid in the ear, you know that through history of with this particular child, that forthcoming will be that otitis media then, of course, or that you know in a given day or so, the child's going to start crying and tugging at the ear and we're going to be in a different state, then by all means we can use something for 
um, for that kind of condition because it is the absolute precursor to um, otitis media or something like that. So I think I'll just check the bottom, see if there's anything else. Ulcer on the gums. Oh, um, ulcer on the gums. If that means ulcer meaning canker sore, because canker sores are a, side, uh, are a type of ulcer. Go to my blog. I've written about it. If it's an abscess, that's something different. Have I spoken about abscesses on, in the, on the gums? I think I have. I think I have on the blog. So, all right. Kelly Muir. Oh, somebody was at, oh, that was probably the answer to uh, the bed's too hard. When a bed is too hard, the remedy is usually Arnica Montana. So it doesn't mean that you have a bad mattress and you should use Arnica Montana. It means if someone's been injured, then by all means, um, and they go to bed and they feel like no matter what position they sleep in, it is too hard, then it is an indicator that you need to use Arnica. Montana. All righty. I think we have got it, folks. Wonderful to see you all. Love you. God bless you all. And remember, hobbies. <laughs> Just like Dolly. God bless. Love you all. See you next week. Bye now.